Okay. Okay, very good. So, so in our last lecture, so basically, yeah, we went through a lot of stuff, right? So first, went to the the house uh, uh, amplitude modulation or PAM pan, right? So basically, it means that. So what is pan? So basically, the pan is mm, something like this, right? So we may have. Uh, right, so this plus one represent a plus one, <coughs> and this kind of waveform maybe represent a, uh, let's say, so we have just a different levels, right? Uh, let's do not write this. So maybe something like this. So let's say here's negative plus, is a plus one, here's negative one, and here's negative three, for example, and maybe the next one is something like that, so it's a plus three, right? We have like four levels, right? So, so in the if we have four levels, let's say, so maybe every level can represent like a number, right? So if four levels means two bits, right? Four possibilities. So we can basically, you know, here we say ne negative three means zero zero, negative one means zero one, and plus one means one one, and uh, plus three means one zero, right? And also you can see this mapping is called gray mapping, right? The the, the meaning of the gray mapping is that. The difference between any two adjacent symbols is only one bit, right? So, yeah, PAM is very important, right? So, yeah, did he say anything about a two-dimensional PAM? Yeah, so one-dimensional is like this. We have, right, only one-dimensional. How about uh, we have two-dimensional stuff, right? So one-dimensional is like four level. Right, how about have two dimensional means, which means that we may have another four level along this direction. Okay, so, or, you know, if we want to write everything down here, right, we have a two dimensional graph, right? So one dimension is four level, two, two dimensional is like 16 levels, right? So actually there's a special name for that modulation, it's called QAM, so which we're gonna go through that today in the end quadrature amplitude modulation. So th that is very, I mean, PAM is not extremely important since we don't use it today, but um, uh, QAM or QAM, so that's very important. This is exactly what we're using today, right? So in particular, this is called 16 Q, uh, QAM, 16 QAM, which means that there are like 16 points here, right? So here, so we're gonna go, yeah, maybe I made, me made a mistake, right? It's not 16 exactly, so <laughs> should be something like that, right? So th this is 16. <coughs> okay, so you can see that in this case, so every point represents like four bits instead of two. Is that clear? Right, so we're gonna go through that probably, I mean about this, so by the way, so this, I mean if we draw that in this way, it's called constellation. Right, does that look like a constellation? Uh, like stars and so on? It's called constellation, right? So we're gonna go through that very carefully next class, uh, next class. But you know, you can think, right, so in this case, I mean, if, if one dimensional is easy, right, how to make the uh, gray mapping, right? How about two dimensional, how can you do that? Actually, it's also quite easy. Think about that, right? It's kind of a combinatorial problem, but it's not that hard to solve. Okay, and, um, <coughs> and uh, so this is a basic modulation of, uh, of, uh, of, quant uh, of a pen, right? So uh, this is our input signal, and then we have a pulse shaping here, and then we have our transmitted signal, and now the question is that how can we design the pulse shaping filter, right? So we know that, so this may not be, so this is an example of QAM, of PA, oh sorry, of, of PAM, right? And then if we look at it in the magnet, in the frequency domain, it looks like that, right? So in the time domain, so here in particular, we basically use a rectangle, or, or square kind of, rectangle shape, right? Rect function. And uh, you can see we have lots of this uh, very big jump here, right? So the result of it is nothing but, so we have in the frequency domain, so this is basically the power spectral density, and uh, all of you know how to compute that, right? In particular, may maybe that's just to remind you. So in this case, it is nothing, I mean, if we write the input signal as in the, what uh, uh, we r write in the slides, then uh, the power spectral density is what? Anybody still remember it? For yeah, for this input, I mean, let's say for x of t, right? We have input s, look like that, and then we pass through that filter, and then what is the power spectral density of x of t? Yeah, 
I mean, yeah, if independent of, yeah, whatever we have, so very good. So that is the power spectral density. If we write it in the general form, right? So that will be what? One over TB. So basically in this case, so this sigma square S square is nothing but the power spectral density of this S, right? So if you remember this, how we denote this? And then times PFF, <coughs> PF square, right? So this is a very important formula, just remember that, right? I mean, so this is for the cyclic, sta cyclical, cyclic stationary uh, random process ST look like that, so. And uh, so we know this pulse shaping is not uh, desirable because the side lobe is kind of big, right? Um, in order, you know, and um, and uh, in practice, uh, in practice, so if we want to use a smaller side lobe or whatever, right? So we may introduce inter-symbol interference, right? Because the reason of that is precisely, uh, you know, if I look at this formula again, so yeah, maybe let me write down what is I, what, what X look like, right? X of T look like this. Right, so depend on the pulse shaping here, right? If we do not use like uh, exact rectangle, you know, the pulse shaping is like that, right? And then there, the, the symbol and, you know, among symbol, there are some interference, right? We have inter-symbol interference, right? So we need to get rid of those, right? In order to get rid of those, so what are the conditions to get rid of those? Do you still remember? Uh, let's look at the signal in the time domain, right? So let's look at this. So what do we want? Basically what we want is that X and TB, so we, we do the sampling at integers of TB. TB is duration of a symbol, right? So that should be equal to what? SN, right? So that is what we, do, what we want. And in order to achieve it, so we have a condition that, so P and TB, that should be what? One, when N is zero, otherwise it's zero. Right, so from here, we can basically what we can say is that, so this is basically a delta function, right? So in the frequency domain, we should have a flat signal, right? So in order to achieve it, and uh, so we can play some trick like that, right? So, <coughs> so basically in the frequency domain, we could something have something like that, and if you know the summation of them is flat, then we're fine, right? Think about in the frequency domain, what does that look like? Right, so, <coughs> okay, so that is basically uh, basically the idea, right? We can, so this is called the Nyquist uh, criterion, right? As long as we can design a filter, and then in the frequency domain, it looks like that, and if we sum all of them up, so it will become a flat signal, and then we're fine. Is that clear? We still remember that, everybody? Okay, great, so if that is the case, and uh, obviously, so this is one example that we can achieve it, right? So if in the time domain, is a sync pulse, and then in the frequency domain, so that is something like this, right? And obviously this waveform can satisfy the Nyquist criterion, right? But uh, it's of course not realizable in practice, isn't it? Why it's not realizable? Very good, right? The length is, you know, some issue. What are the other issues? Uh, correct. So, <coughs> yeah, we can now do that. So this is, but in order to do that, we need to infinite length long, right? If we cut it, so this will be look like very different, right? So the other thing, so the length is one issue from negative infinity to infinity, right? We cannot do that. The other thing is that, <laughs> <coughs> the other thing is that, so remember that this is a filter, right? So that is a system, right? This is the impulse response. Okay, so this is kind of non-causal, right? It has something on the negative side here, right? So non-causal, I mean, usually 
we cannot do that in practice, right? So we're gonna go through, I mean, I think Nick covered a little bit on that, but I'll repeat it later. Okay, so, <coughs> so this is uh, the filter that uh, is used in practice the most frequently, it's called race cosine filter. So uh, in the frequent domain, it looks like that, right? If we do the shifting here, right? So it will, if we add everything up, it will become one, right? Are good. And the important thing here is that we have this uh, rolling factor, alpha here, right? Remember, you know, just remember this relationship, right? It ends at this point, right? And then, you know, we may need to design this rolling factor in practice, right? For example, let's say, if I give you the bandwidth of the filter is what? It's something, right? It means that, okay, this big, so that's your bandwidth, right? So this is band, right? So you just need to, the bandwidth is a function of alpha in this case, okay? Okay, so I don't think we need to remember this, but you know, just remember the meaning of that. So this is a signal in the time domain, and, and the one important thing is that, so here, when uh, alpha becomes bigger, which means that, the filter becomes, you know, wider, then the silo will become smaller. This is what we desire in the time domain, right? But in the frequency domain, it becomes uh, wide. But there's a trade-off there, right? If we pick a smaller alpha, so it will be, become smaller in the frequency domain, but in the time domain, so it will be, you know, so it will have, you know, bigger silo. That causes interference. Right, of course, you know, that causes interference under condition if the sampling is not at exact right time, right? If at exact right time, we know it will be canceled, everything's zero, we're good, right? But it almost never happens in practice, right? We still want, you know, the slope to be as smaller as possible, okay? But that is in the time domain, right? Try, try to be distinguished a little bit, you know, slope in the time domain and the slope in the frequency domain, right there. Side lobe, yeah. This is a, yeah, this is how I call it. Okay. I don't know how people call it in the book. Yes, this is, but as long as you know what I mean, um, it's fine. And also, you know, another important thing here is that, you know, here you can see, so in the time domain, it's a sync function multiply something, right? And you can understand this as what? Sync function in the frequency is basically a rect, rect function, right? And this is another function, it's in the frequency domain, it's a, you know, rect function and the convolve, convolute with something, right? That's how we get this shape, okay? So, this idea how to get it. And uh, so far, what we consider is this uh, so-called band-limited communication, basically, which means that the transmit signal has a band, is band-limited, and, um, and uh, so in this case, we, do, we have a channel here when you design a transmit filter. So that's a risk cosine, somehow like that. And uh, we need to design a, field, uh, a receive filter here, right? So I think how we think about this problem, you know, intuitively is that, okay, let's say if we do not have the channel, the channel is just one, right, or a delta function, right? And then how can we design this and that, right? If we also ignore the noise, Right, so we have nothing in between. We have a transmit filter, and then we have a receive filter directly. And then the way to design this is basically this convolute that give you a, a, a risk cosine. Do you remember that still? Yeah. Right, because as we said, right, we want to, you know, this filter has to be, I mean, not has to be, but uh, one good option is a risk cosine, right? So if we do not have the channel here and we do not have the noise, so this convolutes that, so that should be a risk cosine, right? And um, so the, and then, but now they're, they're separate, right? Then how can we design that, right? So it can be shown that if we don't have the channel, okay, in the book actually, so only have the noise, and then we can show that. So PT and PR just, just make their equal, both of them are real and equal, and both of them is the square root of the risk cosine, and then that can maximize your SNR. Right, so we don't go through that in class, but uh, just read the book there, right? It's very easy to understand. So basically, in terms of mass, they only use the one important property, which is uh, cauchy schwarz inequality, right? Just be careful on that, and the derivation is pretty straightforward. Okay, so this is how we design the transmitter receive filter. It's just square root of the risk cosine. SR means square root, 
right? SR, SR RC, this, this is the first SR means square root, second uh, RC means risk cosine, right? Square root, risk cosine, that'll give you uh, the transmit and receive filter, right? And, okay, so, yeah, this is how we design, or, you know, if we design a filter in this way, it's called matched filter, right? The definition of the matched filter is a filter that maximize what? Your isodar in the end, okay? So the reason it's called matched filter is that, you know, if we do the convolution of PT and PR because they are the same, so you can also represent this convolution as some form like autocorrelation. You just do an autocorrelation when they overlap, you sample it. Right, that will give you the maximum, you know, energy or power, right? So that's basically the idea. Okay, so lastly, uh, we talk about uh, causality, right? So basically, in order to deal with the causality, we do two things, right? One, I mean, one, we need to shift everything, or we, we need to first truncate it, right? <laughs> if it, <coughs> it lasts forever, we cannot, you know, shifting doesn't matter, right? We truncate it to the finite number of samples or you know finite range and then shift it to the right part and then that'll be causal. Truncate, truncate the filter, right? So if we <coughs> so the PT, I say it looks something like this. Right, that's our PT. Okay, how do we do this? So we first truncate it. So remember, risk cosine also goes from negative infinity to plus infinity, right? <coughs> so, but the point of risk cosine is that, so this side lobe, this, you know, this wrinkle can be smaller compared to rectangle shape, right? Rectangle is like very big, right? Here it's much smaller. So if we truncate it, to keep it long enough, it sort of doesn't matter much, right? Because what we ignore are, have very small magnitude, right? So we first truncate it, and then we shift it to the right, okay? So let's say here zero, we shift it maybe, you know, around here, so, and then end at zero. And now this filter is a causal filter, right? So if we shift that in time, remember that in the frequency domain, what do we do? There's a phase shift. So this phase shift, phase shift has to be estimated correctly. Otherwise, you know, this can be important in practice, <coughs> okay? So, yeah, that is almost everything we cover in the previous lecture. So, any questions? Yes, I did a long time, and then, you know, there's midterm between that. So, I thought maybe you don't remember much. So, you shift it to the right to make it causal. Yeah. I assume, like, you have to shift it by the distance you truncate. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we just, you know, shift like the length will be like this. We shift that until here. So. Okay, very good. Okay, let's, uh, I'll talk a little bit. So Nick went through that briefly last lecture. So I'll talk a little bit more on how to kind of, you know, do the digital filtering, right? Because, you know, this is analog, right? So, <coughs> you know, uh, in practice, we can do analog, but, you know, at least in MATLAB, we cannot really do analog, right? MATLAB, everything is digital, right? So in order to simulate the system in MATLAB, we need to somehow have the digital version of all the filtering stuff, right? Yeah, let's see a little bit reason why that is okay. First, okay, so yeah, let's consider a system like this. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we still consider our system that looks like this. So I don't write from negative infinity to plus infinity anymore, right? Just a summation of n over n, so you understand what I mean here. So basically, our input signal looks like that, and then we pass through a filtering. Let's say this is our transmit filter, it's SRRC, and then we have our transmitted signal x of t, right? So. <coughs> So basically, as we said in practice, so we do not have this analog filter. But let's consider, uh, so what do we do with that? We can take, you know, we sample the filter basically, make it look like a discrete time filter. So what we do is that we take a sample of the filter, 
let's say kts, where ts is sampling time. Okay? So we define you know, that <coughs> as this. We'll just denote that as you know, a digital uh, you know, discrete time filter. Right? It's a notation. Okay? <coughs> so here we can think that, okay, so TB is our symbol time, right? And uh, here we sample it, you know, over TS. It's like on over one symbol time, we need to sample enough number, right? So you can imagine that TS has to be much less than TB. Does that make sense? Symbol time, right? So usually, you know, maybe like TS is like two times or four times TB or so on. You can make it as large as possible. Is there like a minimum criterion? Yeah, yeah, something like that. You know, the Nyquist uh, sampling theorem. So it's related to that because, you know, the, the bandwidth of the signal is a function of TB, right? So that's why I said that, that I think, you know, depend, it really depends on what kind of, in the, in the, of this signal, right, X of T. So it really depends on what kind of filter you use there, right? But at least two times. Yeah, at least two times. Good question. Okay. <coughs> so let's think about maybe some input signal or like that. We can have maybe S0 like this. Yeah, you know, this, this means that S0 multiplied delta function here, right? And then maybe the second one is S1 multiplied another delta function. And uh, the third one is another uh, S3, uh, 2, uh, multiplied another delta function. Let's say here is 0, here is 1, here is 2. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> so now what we want to do with that, we want to, you know, use a discrete time version of signal to represent this. Right, let's see how to redo that. Okay. Uh, I think I'm done. Um, I didn't done with that yet. Okay. Oh. <coughs> oh, by the way, so those are the agenda for today. So we're not starting here yet, right? First, I'll talk about MATLAB code for PAN. You're gonna use that afterwards. And then I'll talk about <coughs> I diagram and timing phase, AM, QAM, AM mean, meaning <coughs> uh, amplitude modulation. I just remember this, I'll remove it. Uh, th those are our agenda for today. <coughs> all right here. Okay, let's see how we can do this. So basically, so what we're gonna do with that, we're gonna sample this signal, right? If we, you know, if we do a sampling on the filter, we're gonna sample on this as well, right? So let's say if we sample on the ST, we do the same sample rate, uh, SK times TS, right? Do the sample rate, and then the signal will look like SN is, <coughs> is nothing. And then it will be delta, what? K, TS, TS minus NTB, right? So we can write something like that, but uh, you know the problem is here. What is the problem here? It's a TS, right? So this is kind of annoying. We want something like because you know remember that in in the in the discrete time version of the signal, we all we only have like delta n, right? We do not have scaling, right? I have delta e if it's like a delta n there or delta delta k there. Our life is much easier, right? How can we make that? So actually, remember the property of uh, the delta function, right? So if we write something like that. <coughs> as n, so let's write in this way, let's say we take out of the ts, k multiply minus tb over ts, how about that, right? So if we write down the function in this way, can we take the ts out? Right, we can take the ts out, right? It should be one over absolute value of ts, but at ts is, um, Positive, right? Just remember, so it's absolute value. <coughs> Doesn't matter here, but now we have here k minus NTB over TS. Right? This is just the property of the direct delta of the uh, direct delta function, right? If you hopefully still remember the property, it's like alpha t equals to one over absolute value of alpha delta t, something like that, <coughs> right? Okay, so if we write it this way, so now our life is much easier, right? So, so this one, we basically, you know, denote that as kind of 
a discrete time version of the delta function. That is okay. Right, remember that. So if, let's say here, how about we write n multiply, sorry, k multiply, <coughs> k multiply what n times Pb and over Ts, we denote that like that, right? The condition, the requirement is what? Is that because now everything has to be integer, so we ju just need to make sure this guy is an integer. And then we're fine, right? Does that make sense? So in figure, right, if we want to replicate this figure, it basically means that, so at zero we have a, so <coughs> at zero we have a S zero, right, but now we have a number of zero here, okay, and uh, how many number of zeros here? It's this ratio, right? And then we have another guy, so that is S1, and uh, okay, we have another three zero, let's say, S2, and so on. Right, just, you know, you know, the total number here is Tb over Ts. Just, you know, be careful. So the number of zero here should be Tb over Ts minus one. Okay, just be a little bit more careful here. So this is how we represent, you know, try, when we try to simulate the system. So w this is what we do, right? We just, you know, r put enough number of zeros here. But enough number of zeros here will determine by, you know, the sampling rate, the, you know, the ratio between the sampling rate and uh, the duration of a symbol. Does that make sense? Or no? That makes sense, mm -hmm. but uh, why are we sampling S? I thought the, the whole point was to sample S over. Oh, because we want to make the filter like uh, this, right? Digital filter, I mean the input has to be digital. Has to be discrete time, oh. right? I mean. Remember, so the definition of a continuous time system, meaning both input and output are continuous time, right? And uh, when you know want to you know implement the, in the digital or discrete time, so everything has to be discrete time, right? Filter discrete time, and uh, our system dis discrete time, and the input signal is also discrete discrete time. Okay, and if we sample, of course, I mean those two has to be sampled at the same rate, right? Okay, so. I mean, that is basically how we do in MATLAB. We can also do this in practice even, right? Doesn't mean, I mean, it's not a, you know, purely simulation point of view. We can do this in practice. You know, in practice, so everything is discrete, right? So we consider, so this is our discrete input. We put a number of zeros here, and then we pass that with our filter, look like that. So digital filter is much easier to design, okay? And then, so we have a discrete time signal, right? And then we just put, you know, this to a, let's say, if everything, <coughs> everything is discrete already, then let's say here is our discrete, k, and uh, this is already discrete, k, and uh, just, you know, uh, let's say we have our k, tb over ts, for example, and then, so output is x of k, right? It's the, it's the discrete time signal. <coughs> and then we just put a, what, a DA converter? and then transmit, right? So you can convert a signal from a digital to analog and then transmit, right? I think this is what we do in practice. We don't do much analog filter. It depends on who you ask, right, sometimes. You know. But uh, in my lab, definitely, this is the only thing we can do, right? But w without DA filter, right? In my lab, nothing is analog. Okay, great, any questions? That clear? Are we okay? Good, everybody? Okay. Okay, great. <coughs> so now let's talk about today. Okay. So today's topic, uh, the first thing is <coughs> we're going to see a MATLAB simulation about the PAM signal. <coughs> okay. So so this are the MATLAB code. So I will put the code into, I mean, <coughs> so actually the code comes from a, um, it's called CD. So actually this is a <coughs> software radio book written by Professor Farhan. Okay, and the <coughs> we can download the CD from his website. But uh, unfortunately, for some reasons, his website is down, 
by the output that our our canvas and also the website you can download it from there so there are a number of you know files that you can play with okay and uh, you have to use some of those to do your homework as well okay so here what I'm going to demonstrate is this file pan transmit receive okay so basically that is a communication system so that's <coughs> exactly this right of course a digital version of this right we have a <coughs> this and then we'll pass that with a real uh, real raised square root raised cosine filter and then we have output so that's exactly this one okay so maybe can you see that let me make it bigger how to make it bigger uh, view Yeah, maybe I'll just uh, just do that. Can it work? No. I'll make it bigger. Zoom. So anybody know how to zoom it? Yeah, it shouldn't be here. Okay, but <coughs> if I don't zoom it, can you can you see this? Can you see that? Cannot. Hmm. How to zoom it? Should be view, right? How to do that? I see. <coughs> yeah, don't think there's a, um, but uh, you know, yeah, if you cannot see, just sit in front, probably, to make it better. Yeah, I can see it from here. Okay, but maybe I'll double check how to zoom it in MATLAB. Mm. <coughs> I don't know how to zoom it. Or, you know, if you know, just let me know. Display maybe. What's that? Window. Window. Oh, zoom. Very good. Does it work? I don't think it zoomed. Yeah, no. I don't think it zoomed. <coughs> yeah, anyway, just, you know, try to see that. Okay, so I think the, the code is written, I mean, the code is in the book, actually, right? If you, you, you read the book, you, can, you, you see the code. So I think, you know, overall, it's written pretty clearly, right? So you can see the first uh, TB there is the symbol time, it's 0 0.001, okay? And, and then, so L is basically the number of samples per period, right? L is the... Uh, TB over TS. Okay, the number of symbols, uh, samples per, per per symbol period. Oh, you can see that uh, right here. Right? TS is TB over L. Okay, so and alpha is the rolling factor, rolling off factor of the risk cosine uh, filter. Okay, here uh, it's set to be 0 0.5. You can change that obviously, and here it's kind of important that. So we need the truncation here, n is basically truncation, okay? So here you use eight times truncation, right? Eight times L. Basically, you know, the inter symbol interference can affect at most eight symbol time. Does that make sense? Okay, you can, you know, so let me ask you a question. So now if I change rolling factor, let's say if I take uh, 0.2 instead of 0.5, then how do you pick your n? The truncation should be bigger or smaller? Why smaller? Right, in the time domain, so the side lobe or the ring post will become bigger, right? Yeah. So the, if it's bigger, so we want to, you know, if it's bigger, so the effect, the, the in inter symbol interference be will become more severe. Oh. Right, it's bigger, right? So the inter symbol interference will become more severe. It means that the truncation would be longer or smaller. Longer, right? Because you know the, the, the magnitude is, is higher, right? If alpha is one, for example, it's almost flat, right? Doesn't matter, you know. We can keep it shorter, right? Just remember that alpha smaller and bigger, 
if alpha 0 0.2, a good option for n may be 12, uh, sorry, 12 and times and L. Is the of yes, the yes, so yeah, we, yeah, we measure that as the number of symbol time. Okay, here's eight, but alpha smaller at point 0.2, maybe you're, you're gonna pick n as 12 times L, right? <coughs> okay, sigma v is a noise variance, okay? And the C here is our channel. C means channel. So C equals to one, <coughs> basically the channel is nothing, it's a delta function. And uh, if C equals to this guy, so basically, so this is one kind of one delta, and after some time, another 0.5 times another delta function, right? So this is a multi-path channel we have seen before. Okay, so this is <coughs> those are the parameters, but so for the source here, so here it just randomly generate a thousand bits. Okay, and we use rand n, we can use rand n or rand doesn't matter because we're just gonna take the sign here, right? So I mean rand n, rand, both of them means that one and a negative one happen with half probability. Okay, so here are our source, and then, so here we're gonna do our pan. So if it's two level, we just set our s to b because it's plus one min minus one. I don't need to do anything, but if it's four level, I have to do something like that to have the four level pan, right? Okay, <coughs> and after that, so this is a transmit filter. So there's a function called a square root cos risk cosine. Uh, yeah, square root uh, risk cosine, right? This is a recent function that's in, in the folder. You can take a look. So basically, that is the implementation <coughs> of the risk cosine. The input parameter is the n, the length of the filter, and L is the number of symbols, number of samples per symbol. And of course, the parameter alpha here, right? And here, so when we pass through the, the, the signal, which is uh, our S, and the, through the filter, PT, so we need expander here, so that's a function. So what does expander do? Let's, re let's try to remember, right? So now our S is just, you know, a number of plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. We're gonna pass that signal Exactly, so this expander is exactly doing this. It pad a number of zeros here. So it means that you know if the symbol length is L, it'll pad 99 zeros, right? So <coughs> that's you know, how you know, we can convert everything to the digital filter, okay? Zero padding is a very important technique. So we're gonna see this over and over again. Great, so channel, channel is a convolution. Right, between a, uh, x, c, and c here, and uh, here our c is just one, right? So the delta function, so we just, you know, it's nothing. And um, uh, so is that clear? If c is one, it's just a delta function. Right, just one, convolute with a one. Okay. So, and then, so for our receive signal, we have, you know, after convolution uh, uh, over the channel, and then we add a c the noise power, the standard deviation of noise power times the Gaussian noise here, basically. Okay, run n is a Gaussian normal noise standard normal distribution. So we consider the case where the mean is zero, the variance is nothing but sigma v square. Okay, so with this multiply that, so we have the add the noise power, and we have our x, and then receive filter because our PR equals to PT as you know, this mesh filter that we designed before, and then Y is just nothing but a convolution between XR and PR, and then we got our Y. So is that clear for the code? So any question? It's pretty straightforward, right? It's, 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 I mean, all the comments here are good. It's, you know, if I have any question for this risk cosine function, for expander function, just look at those functions it's in the folder, okay? Okay, great. So, yeah, we go over the code, and uh, now let's uh, continue looking at this display. Let's see what we're gonna display here, right? So what we we're gonna do here is that we're gonna do some reshaping here. <coughs> okay, so so this reshape function is basically the first element means this is our input signal. Remember, y is a vector, right? So Vector, either row vector or column vector, but it's a vector. 
right? And then, so this is that we're gonna reshape this function into, I mean, this direction is t 12, and then this is <coughs> another direction, right? So we're gonna reshape the factor from a, a reshape the vector y to something like two times l, mod, uh, two t <coughs> like two l multiply length of y over two l, right? This multiply that will be the length of y, right? From vector to a matrix. Does that make sense? Right. So let's think about what does that do exactly, right? It basically this two l means what? <coughs> means we take the uh, duration of two l, right? And then we just repeat them, right? So we just look at, uh, you know, we take the, you know, from the beginning to the end, we look at like this big. The reason we're gonna, we look at 2L is that we have risk cosine, right? So that future, you know, we just look at 2L. The reason of that is because we have the, sort of like, we have the rolling factor equals to 0.5, okay? So we take a look at duration of 2L, and then, <coughs> So we have multiples of this, right? We have 2L, 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 but we shift that, you know, down, you know, underneath and so on. Does that make sense? Okay. <coughs> okay, great. Yeah, uh, sorry, yeah, duration 2L means duration of 2TD. So now what uh, we're going to do is that, so here we just delete some transient parts. So we look at from eight until the end minus eight. The reason is that we take n equals to eight multiply l, right? If you know, let's say if we have a you know our signal passing through a filter, the first eight is just a set loop, right? So we want to look at you know everything you know, entirely in the filter, right? We don't want to see you know, something you know, come when we do convolution, something coming in, right? The duration of that is like eight symbol time, and therefore you know, also the end time is also like eight. Right, we'll get rid of those. Maybe seven, right? So the last one is okay. So there are seven duration, simple duration time that we do not want to take a loop. But feel free to get rid of this line and see what you got, you're gonna see, right? The figure you're gonna see later is not as clean as this. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. <coughs> okay, and basically now uh, what we do is that we're gonna plot this. Why? Okay, so what do you think? So basically, if we, we do that, what do we do is that, so they're gonna plot Y column by column. Well, should be, right? But anyway, it, it'll be that everything will be sitting on each other. Yes. So that, exactly, it will be sitting on each other, right? And uh, you can think a little bit, see what you should get here, right? Think a little bit. So what should we get here? Right, let's say, let's say maybe, let's take a timeline here. Let's say here is zero, here is L, here is two L. Of course, L means TB, right? Here's TB, here's two TB. You know, okay, so when we transmit something, right? So, you're gonna get like every path exactly, so maybe zero, something, one, zero, exactly, so this is one like, very good, very good, right? So, I mean, you know what I mean right here? There's some, something like that. So this is one path shape. So this is the, I mean, at L, right? So uh, of course, you know, if we you transmit a negative one, this is a plus one, right? If we transmit a negative one, everything will be flipped, right? It will be something like this, right? And also, you know, at this point, you may have something like this, whatever. Right, and also you can flip this as well, right? At this point, you can have something like this, and it will go over, right? And also, you know, if you flip this, you can have something like that, and if you flip that, uh, how to how to draw that? Uh, <coughs> should be something like that, right? Okay, and of course, you know, for each individual point, you can figure it out, right? If here, here is a one, so everything here should be zero for the you know, interference, 
right? And maybe here, right, something like that. You know, I mean, so so the overlap here should be zero because of you know the the filter design for the match filter. So why is it when it's negative, it's like uh -huh. Uh, let me think. Uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, this is a good question. Mm. So it should be, when we transmit, it should be uh, flipped in this way. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess that makes sense, yeah. Uh, Yeah, it's plus one. It's plus one, negative one. Yeah, if you multiply that by a short string function, then it gets like flipped upside down. Yeah, but you know, we can maybe in practice, I don't know, but this is what happened in practice. Okay. okay. And uh, it is also what uh, we do here. Okay. So if we do that, <coughs> you know, and then, you know, this is like, you know, what we do here, right? It's like every signal is just sitting on top of each other, right? We have one and then we do another one and we do another one and so on, right? So let's uh, see whether this is what happened. Okay, if I do this directly and run this, run. <coughs> hmm? Oh, here, right? Is that uh, what you expect? Yeah, you can see somehow like, you know, it's a little bit different from what I draw here, but you know, if you draw in MATLAB, it's like that, right? So the reason we have this kind of you know, thing is because alpha. So it's uh, you know, there's some big cell over there, right? <coughs> if we, <coughs> let's say, pick alpha smaller uh, or bigger, uh, yeah, of course, you know, I, so you can play around with this afterwards. I don't play this exactly you know, very nicely because I need to also change my end here, but you see, it's much flat, right? So, <coughs> yeah, I'll change our alpha back. And also here, I didn't play any noise here. You can also play around with the noise, right? Let's uh, take a look at this one. So, so basically, I mean, doesn't matter you think whether it's true or not, it's called I diagram. Or there's another name for that. I, let me see. <coughs> I pattern, okay? Is that, does that look like an eye? Yeah, so the important thing is that the middle part here, right? So this has to be as open as possible, okay? So it's like, you know, this part. So we want that to be as large as possible. Let's see, what, I what if we add some noise here? I say noise power is, for example, 0 0.1 instead of zero. Okay, and you can see that, you know, the eye is less open, right? So if we put noise power very big, the eye would be closed. So actually we can see that <coughs> uh, in practice, right? It's completely closed, right? Th it does means that we may not be able to detect anything, right? So we want the eye to be as open as possible. Let's put a zero here, it, it's nice, okay? So any questions so far? Right, this is the I diagram, so let me show you a little bit more here. Let's say, so I also write uh, this code here, so it's uh, kind of fun to play with. <coughs> you can see what I do here is that I do a pause here, right? So then I can make, you know, this as an animation that you can see how this know how we draw this eye. So let's, um, if I, I comment this, uh, T is okay. And then let's rerun this. You can see, so this is how, you know, we draw that, right? It's like everyone sits on each other. Right, that makes sense? Right, we, maybe we can, see a slower version of it, make it uh, maybe 0.5. We're not done yet, right? 
<coughs> so, so basically, you know, <coughs> right? Hopefully, you get the point. Right? This is how we draw the I diagram. Right? It just you know overlap everything. Okay, and um, and that also you can play around this. <coughs> Let's say we have quam, a certain quam for uh, for pen, right? And uh, and you can see this would be the I diagram for for uh, four pen, right? There are four levels instead of two levels. Does that make sense? That means <coughs> the like number of opens in the middle. Okay, so you know just try to play with it and see some insight. Okay, so <coughs> any questions? Any questions? Good? Good? So in reality, we don't really use pan anymore? Uh, no, according to my knowledge. Maybe we do, but. Did you use it like in like a long time ago? Uh, uh, yeah, so it's, um, I don't know exactly the time, but it's, it's a long time ago. But you know, I, I can't exactly show that, right? So as I said, QEM or QAM is a two-dimensional pen. You know, we're sort of still using that just two-dimensional instead of one dimension. Okay. Okay, great. So that is uh, what I want to cover for, <coughs> for the I diagram. So now let's do something for a concept called the timing phase. So this basically tells you, as we said, right? So in practice, you know, if you want to use this filter, so the sample time has to be exact, right? Here is the sample time, we're fine. So here has to be another sample time, we're fine. All the interference here will be canceled. It's all across zero, right? So you can see this concept is not unique here. We're gonna use, I mean, this kind of concept over and over again in this class. So you can see that OFDM is a frequency domain version of something like that. But anyway, <coughs> so we we'll have to you know, sample at exact uh, exact um, uh, right time, right? So what if our sampling time is not right, right? What if our sampling is a little bit off, right? How about let's say, boom, we're here, right? I mean, this is wild. I mean, so this is actually the worst point for the sampling. Yeah. Like yeah. So after you know receive filter, we need the sampling, right? If we're sample at this moment, we just get this one out. It's very good, right? But if we sample here, it's a little bit off, right? So this for this off point point, we we have interference, yeah. right? But the worst point is something around here, right? Intuitively. So if we sample at this point, it's it'll be very bad. Yeah. Okay. So basically, I mean this off is called timing phase, just the distance, right? The, I wrote definition in my notes, I will now repeat here. Basically, it means the value of the timing offset with respect to the time when an eye pattern has a maximum opening, right? Meaning that the distance between this moment and uh, where the eye has the maximum opening, right? This is called timing phase. Okay, so, very good, and let's say, um, <coughs> <coughs> okay, so, yeah, and basically you can write down, you know, the value here exactly, and that means the timing phase. So, okay, so here let's say, let's look at this in the, in the frequency domain, right? So in the frequency domain, when we look at, uh, <coughs> the signal, or so it will be something like this. Risk cosine, right? Remember, it will be something like that. Okay, this is our in the frequency domain. <coughs> okay, so for this risk cosine, let's say. Um, and also remember that 
So in practice, so I mean, ideally, so what's the, so let's say this is the magnitude, right? So ideally, what is the phase of the signal? Right, remember, let's say our input look like. <coughs> This is a frequency domain signal. Remember the the the, the risk cosine filter, right. right? So let's say <coughs> this is our input, and uh, this is our <coughs> after the filter. This is after the filter, right? P. Let's say T minus N T B. Okay, so. Uh, so, so this is real, right? Remember, our filter is also real, right? So, and then our output is also real, right? Everything's real. Our life is good, and uh, or you know the important thing. To this this basically is a frequency domain of our filter, right? So the filter is real. Then what is the phase here at this moment? Phase is zero. Exactly, phase is here is zero. Remember, if it's real, then the phase function has to be odd. Magnitude even, phase is odd. Right, so here has to be zero. But, uh, you know, in practice, we need to shift the filter, right? Because it's non-causal, we can now do, you know, the non-causal version of the filter, right? Or to be shifted to the right, okay? So if we shift in the time domain, so what happened in the frequency domain? Yeah, shift in the time domain, then in the frequency domain, what do we get? Oh, it's a phase shift. It's a phase shift, right? So basically, the point is that, so here we're going to have a linear phase, okay? And uh, the phase function, remember, phase function in this case, you know, that will repeat. So basically, I'm going to have a linear field. <coughs> so for so that's, that's the plot of our filter. Thing. Right. So this is, you know, the phase, you know, that will repeat somehow, right? And uh, you can imagine that, so at this moment, this remember, this point is where we're going to sum things up, right? So if I say this point, this value is exactly the same, right? I mean, this point is where, you know, they cross. So this value, I mean, of here and here, they're the same, right? Let's say, if the phase here and here, they are like the difference between these two is pi or 180 degree. And then if, if you add those two, what happens? They will be canceled, right? So my point is that, you know, here if we do not sample at the correct point, if we, you know, if we don't sample at the correct point, it means that you know we shift the filter, right? So if we if we shift the filter, we have a phase shift, and then for this point, I mean these two add add together will not be as before, right? So they will be cancel each other. You can see in a frequent domain, it will be somewhat look like this. Right here will be zero, okay? Because the phase are opposite, right? And then you know, if we compute the signal power based on this after the phase shifting, so at this mo at this point, or you know, let's say not at this point. I mean, after if we do not sample at the right point, and then let's compute the power. Remember, uh, this um, uh, Parseval inequality, right? What's the power of the signal? It's also equals to this guy, right? No, it's a, so this is um, in the frequency domain, right? Time domain is periodic. Oh, yeah. Fre yeah. Okay, so I mean, <coughs> yeah, time domain is not periodic, right? I mean, whatever. So this is a time domain signal, but uh, in the frequency domain, so it'll be, I mean, if we do the integral over the frequency domain, it'll give you the power, right? So before it's like that, but now it will go to zero if we do not sample at the right time. So if we do compute that, the power will be what? Increase or decrease? Decrease, right? Power basically the area here, yeah. right? 
So the power will be goes down. Okay. So what what can you get from here? It means that if we sample at the right time, <coughs> exactly. And then if we sample do not write at the right right time, so the power will decrease. Right. It's like <coughs> like uh, the power wise, if we plot the, the power curve like this. So if we sample at the right time, it will be like that. And then it will decrease until some point, and then it will increase again. And then it will decrease, and then it will increase again. It will be something like that, right? So for this kind of shape, what do you think? So, you know, do, do you remember any function look like that? Or sine, right? It's a tri uh, trigonometric function, right? So basically, and another point here is that, <coughs> you know, in practice, we need to find the right point, right? Let's say if we do multiple sampling here and then we compute the power, let's say if, you know, if we, this is our sampling point, let's say if we go left, increase, go right, increase, so we know this is a minimum point, right? And vice versa, we can also determine the maximum point, right? So this can actually help us to determine or help us to correct the timing, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this is uh, it's not rigorous. It's you know it j it's um, <coughs> kind of intuitive, right? So let me write it down. So we call this <coughs> basically it's a row uh, x of tau. This tau is basically the timing, the the, the, the timing point. I mean the the sampling uh, offset. Okay. So <coughs> it means that when tau is zero, it means that there's no offset. We have the maximum power. Here is the you know, this is the offset that we have the lowest power. We can show rigorously that, you know, if this is our input and this is our output, and then we use the risk cosine here, right? So this is actually a, a sine function, mm, a cosine function, okay? It's a rho naught plus rho one, <coughs> a cosine, uh, or a sine, I forgot, but something like that, two pi tau over TB. So more or less it's like uh, this function, okay? so. The definition of that is nothing but we just, you know, do the square of each point, right? We sample this at each point, then do the square. That's it, right? And you can imagine that, you know, the power of Px basically also equals to, we do an integral of this guy, right? Basically from one over Tb, one over Tb. So that will basically give you the power of the signal, right? Just, you know, every point square and then uh, we do that. Is that kind of clear? Mm -hmm. Right, you don't need to understand how we get this function, right? I mean, as long as you understand this intuition and what the concept of timing phase is, is uh, enough. So when you're offset by the timing phase, mm -hmm. we don't have zero power, but we have the same. Exactly, we don't have zero power. But somehow, I mean, the power doesn't mean everything, right? We want this point to be one, right? If we sample at you know, this messy point, there would be lots of interference. Although the power, you know, there's some power left, but we really don't want this, yeah. right? <coughs> and also this code, you can play around with. I don't think this part is in the code I'm going to upload, right? But you know, you, you can access the video, right? You can see <coughs> uh, what is going on here. Uh, let me try to, so this is a timing phase computation. So you can basically, you know, compute it uh, you know, basically, I just, you know, so this is our output. I reshape it a little bit and then compute, you know, exactly the definition of that, right? So every point square and then I do some average, right? And uh, you can see what that look like. So it's like this. So you can see that is basically a cosine function. Okay, so this can be shown rigorously. But, um, <coughs> you know, but um, it's not required in this class. Okay, so any questions? Is that clear? <coughs> okay, let's see um, what uh, <coughs> what are we going to do next? So next, I will go over the carrier. Um, Amplitude modulation, so I, we don't need this anymore. Uh, let's get rid of this.
Hmm. Yeah, maybe. <coughs> Just yeah. Okay. <coughs> So <coughs> carrier amplitude modulation. So we kind of you know covered this in our third of handler before. Okay, so basically it's called AM, right? <coughs> Some magnitude modulation. <coughs> this carrier means that we're gonna modulate the signal, shift the signal to some higher uh, carrier. Right, basically multiply cosine function, right? So again, what we have here is like this, uh, our input signal. Right, and then we have pulse shaping filter. And then, so after the pulse shaping filter, we have our X of T, so this is nothing new there, right? So the new thing here is that we're gonna modulate to some higher frequency, which means that we multiply x by cosine two pi f c t. Okay, and then the signal is passing through a channel here, so we just assume the channel is easy. We just uh, <coughs> assume that the, the, the output of the signal is just this channel multiply a here. It just a, sim a very simple one tap fading channel. The a times delta basically for the channel. Okay. So, and then, <coughs> <coughs> and we can see here, so basically what we got here is xt cosine 2 pi fct, and what we got here is what, it's a times xt cosine 2 pi fct, okay? And then what we do at the receiver side is nothing but we multiply another cosine 2 pi FCT. There might be some magnitude in front, right, to get rid of this A or, you know, to rec try to recover uh, X exactly, but that is, <coughs> you know, uh, the idea is that we're gonna multiply uh, some kind of the same carrier, the same cosine again, but, so another possibility of the, you know, of the channel is that instead of, I mean, besides the A here, you know, after passing through the channel, so, you know, there might be some additional phase here. Okay, so which means that after the channel, we may need to add some phase here. Okay, so A times XT cosine 2 pi C uh, plus a phase, right? I mean, this phase cannot, you know, it's very hard to avoid, right? Because, you know, it depends on when we receive the signal, right? But the important thing is that we can estimate the phase. As long as we know the phase, and then we're fine. We just, you know, add another phase term for this carrier frequency. <coughs> Right. Okay, great. So yeah, and then after that, we're gonna pass that through a receive filter, and then we get our xt hat. So this is basically the magnitude modulation. Right, let's see. So you can work out the mass, but uh, let's see what uh, it looks like on each part, right? So let's see here, let's say, oh, by the way, so, so far we consider so a band limited uh, communication, so which means that every signal here has a limited bandwidth, right? Let's assume that for our X, we have this bandwidth. So this is our, yeah, because, yeah, let's consider general case, right? So where, you know, SN is, a, you know, <coughs> this um, random process, okay? So let's consider the power spectral density here. Okay, uh, phi X, <coughs> xx, right, when we consider power spectral density, so let's say it looks like that. Okay, great. And then we know cosine function is what? It's half ej2 pi fct plus e negative j2 pi fct, right? So let's say if we use this function, multiply this, 
So in the frequent domain, it means by frequency FC. Right. So time domain, we have a phase shift. Frequency domain, we have a frequency shift. Right. So therefore, you know, after modulation, so what we have here is like this. Right. Okay. Does that make sense? Right. You know how to compute that exactly? How? I mean, here it's just you know intuitive writing, right? But how can you compute this exactly? If I give you x x s of f. Remember. Yeah, something like that. But uh, just remember that. Let's say the simple case is that. So we know. <coughs> So that would be the power spectral, spec the power spec the power density spectrum, right? Now the PF here is nothing but PD times the cosine function, right? And then you do the square, maybe cosine square you have one over four there, right? You know you can work out this magnitude, okay? <coughs> so this is something here, and then after the channel, and uh, after the channel, I mean it does have a. Um, Magnitude change and then a phase change, right? Phase change happening, you know, if we plot the magnitude, it does, nothing has changed, right? Or the power spectral density. Okay, after modify that, so remember this is another something like that, right? You're gonna shift this guy again, right? So here's FC, here is negative FC. So then something here is that you're gonna shift this again. So if we shift this on this side and shift this on the other side, uh, add them together, right? So we're gonna have something like this. Does that make sense? Right, then we'll have this middle part out, right? And then we pass that through our risk cosine, square root risk cosine filter. Remember, square root risk cosine is kind of like what? Exactly, it's an LPF basically, right? We can filter this guy out and then have our original signal. Does that make sense? So any question here? So is that the power spectral density of x once it passes, once it's multiplied by cosine then, or is the, it's like the second graph, uh -huh. is that power spectral density? Yeah, everything is power spectral density. I, I didn't give it a name here, right? So this is the power spectral density of this function basically. So this is the power spectral density. Uh, it's another phi some coming from here. Okay. okay. So yeah, usually I call this y of t. So this is phi y y of s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> yeah, this is a basic idea. When you how you compute the power spectral density is using the formula that I gave you before, right? Now you can understand the entire future is is this multiply that, right? That squared, and then you can figure out the exact coefficient there. Should be one over four, right? Because cosine here is one over two. You square it, give you one over four. Is that clear? Yeah, but mm -hmm. um, sorry. So w to calculate directly with power, power spectral density, mm -hmm. uh, x signal to your modulated <coughs> x signal, mm -hmm. wouldn't that end up not being multiplied by? Uh, yeah, here in the time domain is uh, is um, uh, is uh, multiplication. Right. In the frequency domain, it will be a convolution, uh, right? It's like you know, if you consider you know the filter before is like let's say a risk cosine is something like that, right? After you know multiply this by cosine, so what you are going to get is this guy. Oh, sorry, this guy, and this guy. Right, but magnitude here will be half if before it's one. Right, but so this is like the new PF, right? You will compute the power spectral density, you need to square this guy. Yeah. Right, then you'll get something like one over four or yeah. right. So just be careful on that. So it's still the same function, but it's involved. Yeah. 
Yeah. So any other question? That clear? Clear? Good? Okay, <coughs> you know, if you really want to draw it, right, so it is something like, you know, uh, maybe I use another color. <coughs> so the reason it's called uh, amplitude modulation is that the amplitude means something, right? For example, let's say if x, x look like this, right, after multiply a cosine function, so this guy will look like what? This, and we need to have another part here, and then, so we have something in between, right, this cosine. Right, so this magnitude means something, okay? So that's why it's called magnitude modulation because magnet the mean amplitude modulation the amplitude <coughs> carries the meaning of the signal. Okay, so is that clear? Okay, great. So do you remember we have seen that before in theoretical handler? Yeah, you should remember, right? You are pretty recent. Okay, so <coughs> another important part for this is <coughs> uh, that. Um, so as we said, so if we want to recover things perfectly, we need this phase, right? If, if remember, if the phase is off, things can be very messy. So you know, redo the computation. If you see, you know, for some value of the phase, the output will be zero. Okay, so the recover this phase is very important. So in practice, how do we recover this phase? Is uh, is like that. So <coughs> basically, we get something out from here. Okay, and then we pass through a equipment called PLL. It means phase lock loop. Yes, locked or lock. Yeah, you know what I mean, right? But yeah. so so we need to lock the phase basically, right? And then we get the, this equation, and then we can go from here, right? So this can be ex extracted from the received signal. So some mechanics to uh, get <coughs> get that, right? This is kind of very important. So if you, you really want to understand how it works, I think there might be another class to teach you how to get that, okay? Okay, so the last topic, so I don't think we're gonna finish it today, but in your homework, you have to use it. So maybe <coughs> I'll just mention it now and uh, we can continue in our next lecture. So basically, <coughs> it's QAM or QAM. So <coughs> it's called um, quadrature amplitude modulation or QAM. So this is what we use today, okay? So the concept is, is not that hard. So before we know Xn is a real signal, right? So Sn is basically what um, <coughs> we write here. <coughs> but now, instead of real signal, we consider this guy as a complex signal. We have a real part, and we add J, multiply, the imaginary part. So if you think, you know, the, if the real part is a one pan, PAM, and the imaginary part is another pan, okay, so this is what we draw before. Yeah, let's think about a simpler version of it, right? Let's consider only the four point case. So this is called QPSK, or four PSK, or four QAM, the same thing. I mean, they just coincide. PSK means phase shift key. So we're gonna introduce that probably next class. So because you know if we draw a circle of it, so these four points will sitting on one circle, and the difference between those two are kind of only the face. But QM is also like that, right? <coughs> and uh, here is a real part. So this line is a real part, and this line is the imaginary part. Okay. So let's consider in maybe. <coughs> Uh, let's see whether I can work out the math here. Let's say the magnitude is one over two. Here is one over square root of two. And then we can get the length of this is one, right? 
<laughs> hopefully, should be. So this value is nothing but this add j times this. You can see that is a complex number, right? And if you want to <coughs> do the, 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 the bit mapping, so this can be simple like zero, zero, okay? And if you want to do gray mapping, here is zero, one, here is one, one, here is one, one, zero. Okay, so that's a gray mapping. Okay, we have zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, and okay. So this is a four quam, right? If, you know, in the beginning of the class, I introduced 16 quam, right? So four quam, every, every uh, you know, every uh, symbol here means two bits, right? 16, every symbol here means four bits. You need this information to do the homework. Okay, just remember that. Uh, okay, so let's stop here. So next class, I'm going to introduce you know, how we can kind of repeat this figure when SN is complex. Okay, so it's slightly different because you may imagine that now we have a complex signal, right? But how can we transmit over the air, right? When we transmit something from the antenna, we can only trans transmit real signal. We cannot transmit complex, right? What is the physical meaning of a complex signal? So next lecture, I'm going to tell you how we can actually do that. It's doable. So, but I think you can do the homework probably from one to six. So, and just go over it. And the next lecture, I'll go, I'm going to go over the QAM and then go over the homework, and then introduce something new. Okay, any questions? Okay, great, yeah, let's stop here. So see you on Thursday.